They may come around for another pass. Captain Nida, the ship no longer appears on our scopes. They can't have disappeared. No ship that small has a cloaking device. Well, there's no trace of them, sir. Captain, Lord Vader demands an update on the pursuit. Get a shuttle ready. I shall assume full responsibility for losing them and apologize to Lord Vader. Meanwhile, continue to scan the area. Yes, sir. Apology accepted, Captain Nida. Welcome, Masters and Padawans, to episode 561 of me, Brian Young, host of the show, and with me as ever, well, not as recently, but for now, and for the time being, and for the foreseeable future, <laughs> the well-traveled Holly Fry. Hi, hi, hi. Sorry, I'm always running around. No, it's so good to have you back. I've missed you. Ditto. Ditto. I've been the busiest bee. I love to travel, as you know, but like... I definitely hit a wall a couple weeks ago where I was like, I'm going to be glad when I'm through this corridor and I can have three weeks at home. Yeah. Which I'm having now and it feels delightful. Yeah, no, I I love that feeling of like traveling for too long where at the beginning you're like, oh man, this is so great. I'm traveling. But by the end you're like, I am ready for my bed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, also just, you know, because my job is like constant deadlines. Anytime I'm traveling, it's just making it harder to hit all those deadlines. So it's always a little bit stressy, Um, even though I love the travel part, whether it's for work or leisure. Um, But I'm, you know, it's been a long time of like no letting up and like no time to just sit on the couch and veg. So I'm ready. I did, yeah. I did some of that this morning. It was pretty great. Nice. So we've got we've got a varied episode for you this <laughs> evening. Um, we've got what what I'm calling two rants in an uh, two rants in an episode. Yeah, that seems fair. Uh, two two rants in a topic. So um, we had we had a couple of, of things we wanted to talk about, and uh, Holly had an issue she wanted to rant about, and I had an issue I wanted to rant about, and then there was an event that Holly went to. Yeah. So I figured we'd start with Holly's rant and okay. then we could go to my rant and then we could talk about uh, Halsicon. Yes. My rant is not related to Halsicon, but I feel like the message of Halsicon harkens back to the rant. So we'll have a whole full circle thing. Excellent. That'd be great. Okay. Here's my rant. I almost got in a fight with a cast member at Disney world, <laughs> which that seems hard to do because cast members at Disney world are supposed to be like the happiest people on earth because it's supposed to be like the happiest place on earth. Well, I mean, yes, they're also human and I don't want to make yeah. it, you know, but I, and I am also very unlikely to fight with somebody. Um, Cause I just don't like it. Like I'll walk away from a thing, but this cast member said something that, made me really angry it wasn't that she said it it was that she said it and then when we got into a discussion she doubled down on a complete falsehood that i think is dangerous for someone in a public facing role with that company to be telling people that they don't know their level of informed i've had an experience with a cast member like this as well So here's what happened. I'm going to take a swig of my Diet Coke because I need the energy. (laughs) So on uh, last Sunday, my beloved and I had tickets to Mickey's Not So Scary Halloween Party. Was it not so scary? I mean, it's never scary. It's always fun. We go at least once a year, sometimes a few times a year. This year, that would be our only one, which was kind of funny because it was also raining um and it was after we had just transferred over to our hotel 
on Disney property from the event we're going to talk about later. And like, we even debated over not going because of the rain and like, we were just exhausted, but um, we were lucky enough to be at a hotel that uh, we were at the contemporary. So we could just walk over to magic kingdom and it was like not arduous for us to be like, let's just go check it out for a minute. Um, So we did. And that was great. So we went over, we were running around. We had a great time overall, even in the rain, it was so much fun. And we're lucky because we're there enough that like, if we don't get to do a ton of stuff, we're fine. But we actually still did quite a bit. But we were in um one of the shops. And I don't want to say anything identifying about even what shop it was. Because I don't want to get anybody in trouble. But it really made me angry. Um, So we were in one of the shops, completely not related to Star Wars in any way. Like one of the other shops in Magic Kingdom. Um, and I had on like a Haunted Mansion thing and Brian had on um, just his kind of in-universe Star Wars gear that he wears. Like he has a a blue poncho that I made him for our first Star Cruiser um, trip that he loves and he's worn it many other times and like some goggles and stuff. He was just kind of like a an in-universe. He looked very much like, you know, Rogue One ground crew. Um, and this cast member we were checking out and she made she was like can I tell you bad jokes and we were like sure and she told us bad jokes and I don't remember the specifics of the joke she told she told me a Haunted Mansion one and then Brian a Star Wars one and she was like do you want a general one or like a more a deeper cut and we're like oh a deeper cut and it wasn't that deep a cut it was like something referencing like the short for a Stormtrooper line I think and um or something like that and we were like that's not really a deep cut she's like oh you'd be surprised a lot of people haven't haven't seen the original trilogy. And Brian was like, yeah, I definitely run into that some, but sometimes that's really fun to talk about people's Star Wars. She goes, well, and this is where it takes a turn. Up to this point, it's been a delight. Well, Kathy Kennedy said my Star Wars doesn't exist anymore. And, you know, (laughs) I, I, I initially, my response was not anger. It was kind of like hilarity. And I said, no, she didn't, Um, which is dismissive. I know. And she goes, and she looked me in the eye, took a beat, and she she said, oh, yes, she did. And I literally had that moment where I was like, I feel Brian like bristle because he's like, oh, God, Holly's going to get in a fight. Um, (laughs) And I literally was like, honey, I will toe up with you on this issue because you are flat out wrong. And she was like, no, she said that all of the the EU stuff doesn't exist anymore. And I said, that is categorically incorrect. That is absolutely not what was ever said. It still exists. They're still even republishing reprints and new editions of some of it. They just aren't, they're just not including it automatically in the guidelines of what's canon so that they can maintain consistent storytelling. And she's like, no, they got rid of it. And I'm like, you are lying. You are making things up. And I finally was like, no, that's not true. And if you pay any attention, there have been things that have been plucked out of legends and used in current canon storytelling and she's like well i don't care about thrawn and i was like then i'm going to leave like i literally didn't want to get into it with her beyond that but i was there was part of me that was like run back in there and yell at her um (laughs) that's not cool or adult either but i just when i run into somebody like that what i want to say is this like i want to pluck all of the weird stuff from the EU or even the stuff that people have historically not always agreed on, which again, I think it should all be there, right? All the legend stuff has a right to be what it is. And it's super fun. I mean, one, we both know, and I think most people know George Lucas didn't consider any of that Canon ever. ever. So like I, it's again, I, nothing really changed except like defining what had always been the case when when that whole change happened but two i wanted to be like do you want the yuzan vong to be real do you want you know chewy to have died which i actually love that book but i know a lot of people didn't like i want to be like you can't only cherry pick the parts of legends that you like and say that those should be canon because everybody has a part everything is somebody's favorite right and like 
I don't know why it's so hard to grasp that like this idea that there is a branching tree of Star Wars lore and storytelling. And there's like canon, which I would describe, I just hit my computer, canon, which I would describe as the main trunk of the tree. And then there are branches and those branches don't necessarily impact the like growth of the tree in a a substantial way, but they're still there. And so I don't understand why people get so weird about it. Like I read legend stuff as much as anybody and I, it never troubled me. So I don't understand this attitude that persists and like is being spouted by people that work for the parent company, which should not be happening. Um, the thing is, is that for I think I think the issue is the industry for Star Wars, for Lucasfilm, to communicate that the expanded universe went away and became legends was something that cost them some marketing dollars to issue a press release and deal with their licensees to make that happen once, right? To make it clear that once that that was happening. And they didn't spend any more money on it because why would they? Right. And for the people who grift outrage on it, it has made them money consistently over the last 10 plus years since that switchover happened in April 2014. They've made money on it every day since April 2014. Right. And like, so, I, I understand the mechanism. I want, I don't want to cut you off, but like, I do want to de- kind of define what that mechanism is, right? Like why that works so well, which is that there to, it's perfectly natural to be like, oh, I'm sad now that the potential of this thing to become like a live action, whatever, you know, is, is diminished. And I, I understand sadness about that when it's something you're attached to, but now the people that grift on that are like, I see you and I see your sadness and it's correct. And you should be angry. And like, that's an intoxicating cycle. Like I understand why that has worked as a financial plan. It's frustrating. It's frustrating. And it's like, there's no financial incentive for Lucasfilm to jump into that game. Right. Right. Like there's no financial incentive for them to have anything to counter that narrative because there's not really a way to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a. The only thing to do is do what they're doing and just continue making great stories um, and have folks like us go like, eh, that's not true. Oh my goodness. Or in my case, start barking like a chihuahua at a woman. Yeah. Um, which isn't cool either. I really didn't bark. I swear. I was yeah. just like, I mean, I told you about my weird interaction with a cast member over weird star Wars stuff, right? I don't remember. It was, it was after celebration Anaheim, not the last one, but the one before that. And it was like the day after, and I went to the parks and I was at a character breakfast and, uh, one of the cooks there was talking to me about Star Wars and then just started making really inappropriate comments about Carrie Fisher's weight. Ooh, no. And I was like feeling really uncomfortable about this and, and like super uncomfortable about it. And I was like, you know, trying to like deflate what he was saying. And he just kept going and doubling down on it. And I was like waiting in line at the buffet at the character breakfast. So it's not like, I was going anywhere. I was this guy's captive right. audience. Like he was making my eggs or something. Um, and it just got more eggs. and more awkward. And I ended up, um, I ended up going to city hall and just like, like I'd never felt so awkward with a cast member ever. And I went to city hall and was just like, I, I don't want to get the guy in trouble. Like I tipped him. He was great except for like that moment. Right. I don't want to get him in trouble, but just like maybe talk to him about this. Right. Um, and like a week later, someone from Disney called me and they were like, like. Effusive in their apologies and they're like, we want to make this right for you. 
we want to send you an autograph of Darth Vader. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that sounds great. Um, that would be totally great. And they're like, we'll send you some fast passes too. It'll be great. Like we, we really just want to make this up to you. Um, that was horrible. Like nobody should have had to go through that. Cast members should know better, et cetera. And like two weeks later, I get a package and I'm like, it was right on the heels of celebration. I'm like, I don't like which Darth Vader, like, <laughs> like is it? Hayden Christensen or James Earl Jones or like no, Dave Prowse. Like, I don't know. And I open the package and it's literally like there in park. Darth Vader had signed an autograph as Darth Vader. Yeah. Um, and I just had to laugh like hell. I love it. I love it. Um, but yeah, it was awkward and weird and it wasn't to the level that you did, but like, yeah, I do. I, I have those run-ins with people too. And it would be an order of magnitude worse to have it be a, a Disney representative at any yeah. level telling me something so blatantly untrue. Yeah. It made me really angry. Um, I don't like, I know the difference. I just don't, uh, I don't want her to say that to some person that doesn't fully understand and like cause problems. I don't, everybody just be cool. I don't, I don't get it, but I will, um, I, there is, one, I had an antidote that very evening in terms of just like feeling grr. Like it was less than 30 minutes later, we were outside and it was still raining, but they did the fireworks anyway. And the park had kind of cleared out at that point because, um, you know, a lot of people that go for the Halloween party that have little kids, they stay through the first parade and some of them clear out after that. The Halloween parade runs twice normally. It didn't that night. Um, but after, and sometimes they'll stay for the first parade and then hang until the fireworks. And they kind of line up on Main Street, watch the fireworks, and then book it out of the park. But because it did start raining a bit more, a lot of people left and skipped the fireworks. Um, and it was also like a little bit of a crapshoot. We didn't know if the fireworks were going to happen for sure or not because of the inclement weather. But they did happen. And so we were in this quiet, relatively quiet park. And there's a segment in the um, in the the fireworks show where they're playing Once Upon a Dream, and we saw several dozen cast members all like singing and dancing their fake ballet in the rain to it, and it was the most charming thing ever. And I was like, oh, this fixes my crabby from my bad interaction, so it got fixed. Um, but I also, when we come back around to talking about Halsicon. There was a whole, there's a whole antidote to that feeling. If you feel like some part of Star Wars that you loved is no longer an important part of Star Wars. That's my rant. What's yours? Oh, I, uh, oh boy, it's been a week in Star Wars. <laughs> so there's a new book coming out that is sort of a, a memoir of Captain Rex sort of talking about the clone troopers and some folks got their hands on an early copy as as happens yeah and in this book is our first official art of sister the clone that made her first appearance in ek johnston's queen's hope yeah in 2022 and so the only art we've had up to now was art that was commissioned by ek johnston um, because she wanted to see art of Sister. Um, and Sister is a clone who uh, did not feel right in her body and felt female and was embraced by the other clones. And they called her their sister. And, uh, you know, uh, the other clones were fine with that. And Rex, in his write up, in his first person write up in this book, sort of just talked about how welcoming. Uh, he was about that. And uh, apparently sister, though she's been in the canon for two years now and was written up at the time. Right. Like I know I, I went back and checked my review of Queen's Hope, who mentioned her and used the artwork that E.K. Johnston had uh, had done. And I looked again. Uh, many articles mentioned sister 
And then again, it happened when um, Mike Chen used Sister in Brotherhood and she had another cameo, uh, you know, a year later, last year. Um, so the fact that now she is in this book, particularly that it's blowing up and I, I don't know if it's just because it's an election year and people are losing their minds or something. But this news has gone viral in a way that it didn't before, and it's getting very vicious out there. And yes. there's a lot of pushback about it because this book is a kid's book. It's not a kid's book, but it's it's a book labeled for all ages right? Uh, from Inside Editions. And uh, people are having a fit about it because it's, it's – uh, promoting the trans agenda to kids and it's insidious and i'm very upset by people who are upset about this um me too yeah so and it's it's gotten really out of hand too i mean people again these these the the grifters are making videos um about this sort of stuff trying to convince people that somehow um the existence of trans people is somehow controversial, that it's not age appropriate for kids of any age to know that trans people exist, that there's any such thing as trans people, um, that – I don't know. Like there's no – I don't understand where a lot of this is coming from. And I don't understand why they think that it's unacceptable for kids to understand that trans people are um, just in in the people. world. Yeah. As they always have been, like as someone that studies history, this is not a new thing. There's just a little bit more understanding of it now and, a, you know, more recognition that this has always been part of the human experience. Yeah, no. So there's there's there was someone who came to me and said, like, well, why would you want kids to know about this? And my response was, well, you know, because kids, you know, being trans, having gender dysmorphia, you know, these things aren't choices that anybody's making. Right. This is this is something that someone feels this is a uh, uh, genetic this is a biological thing this is this is something it's not i i really struggle with people who are just like oh they're mentally ill they should be in asylum oh yeah that's it's, very frustrating it's really not okay this is this is something that that um that that is not just a choice right like it's it's like i didn't choose my hair color right i uh, did but that's different <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you you're 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 a bright and shining penny in different ways, Holly. Um, but uh, then they're like, well, why would you why would you want them to know about this? These people, you know, die by suicide. Forty one. You know, they, they've got a they've got a, a, a death by suicide rate of forty one percent. And I had to explain to them, like, the reason they have that high of a rate is because of the lack of acceptance of them. The fact that you try to keep information about their existence away from them as kids. The fact that people treat their existence like a debate. Right. Um, the fact that there's an uproar over there being a clone that is trans contributes to those things. That when when you have a, a, a friend or a kid who has, um, you know, when they have these feelings of gender dysmorphia or they have uh, feelings that they could be in the wrong body, right? And they see their parents raging about a clone that's trans and people uh, pushing this agenda on children. Do they feel safe with their parents anymore? Nope. Do you think that makes them feel safe at home? Do you think that makes them feel like they should be accepted at home? Do you think that's going to make them feel comfortable? Do you think that might contribute to thoughts of uh, suicide? 
right? Like, so there's the issue. Like, that's the reason that rate is so high. And so people who rage about this stuff are the reason life is so unsafe for these folks. And I just want – I want people listening to, like, think about, like, before they start raging about this stuff – if you're listening to the show, my guess is you're probably not one of those sorts of people who are raging about it. But if you are, think about it. Like, think about what you're telling your friends who might be trans that that haven't told you, um, that are still afraid to tell you, who might never tell you because they're afraid how they feel or what their safety level is like with you based on how you might react to this. Yeah. Something yeah. as simple as a clone trooper who is trans, which makes perfect sense. A lot of people have been saying, like, oh, this doesn't make sense in the canon. And for that, I would say, <laughs> have you watched the Clone Wars? It's right? so fascinating, right? Like, in the Clone Wars, we learned that the exposure to the Jedi of the clones made them so uniquely individualistic, right? We have all of the clones are so different, right? Like, Rex and Cody are night and day. They're all diff- they're all so different, right? Like you can tell the difference between Echo and Fives. You can mm-hmm. tell the difference between, um, you know, Cut Laquain and um, Jesse, right? Like all of them are different, and that's not even counting the Bad Batch. And I I mentioned this to one of the people raging about this, and they're like, the only clones that have completely different individual individuality or like clone force 99 and they're genetically defective. So are you saying that like, Oh my Lord. Are you saying that sisters just defective? I think that's way to check out of the entire series, I guess. Oh man. Is that really what you're saying? That's not (laughs) what I'm saying. I'm saying the Jedi coax out that individuality in all the clones. That's why they all have nicknames. That's why they all have individualized personalities. And it's because the Jedi revere that individuality of who they are as people, even though they're clones. And that's why the Empire gets rid of them, gets rid of the Jedi, and then takes people who are individuals and turns them into faceless clones as stormtroopers and gives them numbers and robs them of that individuality. Yeah. It doesn't ma- matter if they're men or women. They still just have numbers and no personality whatsoever when they become stormtroopers. Yep. That's um, the point of the story. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my two cents, I I am not a parent, so I will always caveat with that. But my two cents on why it is not just fine, but important for kids to be exposed to stories like this is that one, it just models the idea of meeting people where they are and accepting them for who they are. Right. The fact that the clones are like, we get it. You feel like you have a a different situation than the majority of us. And that's cool. You're still part of our family. You're our sister. A great, like you want to model that for kids that everybody can be themselves. And that is cool Two. How many kids, I mean, I'm a little older than you, so I am very aware of the shift that's happened over time of like how many people that I have known that I didn't know at the time were grappling with these kinds of things of like not feeling like they were aligned with the gender they were assigned at birth of like trying to figure out and feeling like there was something wrong with them. And a lot of kids you know, experience that. And if they just have some kernel of, I wouldn't even call it a guideline, but just recognition that, you know what, you're not, you're not the, the lone person in this. This is not unique to you. This is something other people have experienced and understand. And like, why would you not want to ease the minds of kids who are struggling with, you know, something that they think might be wrong with them when it is not like that's what I don't I don't understand why you would want that nobody is trying to convince anybody to think that way they're just showing that some people are different and they are transgender and that's totally cool I don't understand why it's such a struggle but those are the two reasons that I just think it's important right like model acceptance and show people that it's completely fine I think that's (laughs) part of why it's it's acceptable for kids of all ages that that um it is really important i think you're right like that that it's important 
um, for kids of any age to understand that 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 people have feelings of who they are and that those are authentic and that those are something that they can express validly um and it they don't have to wait until they're 18 to do it right because like there's nothing more miserable than a childhood where you're forced to express yourselves in in ways that are inauthentic um and if star wars can help be a gateway for these kids um to express themselves authentically then 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 what's the issue right like yeah as a parent as a parent of a trans kid right like um all i want is my kid to be happy and i watched my kid be miserable and bullied and watched them um decide without any prompting from me that they were just going to start presenting uh, a different way at school and then they felt like that bullying stopped they just fit in better and they were just so much happier and like who am i to go like nope this was not what you were assigned at birth right you're not allowed to do that like why would i why would i step in the way of that why would i want them to be miserable if they found something that works better for them just like if they want to wear different clothes, like who cares? <laughs> like what, like why would I step in the way of that? And like, it doesn't make any sense to me. Like what sort of monstrous parent would you need to be to be like, Nope, can't wear that to school because of your, your gender assigned at birth. Well, it's also right. An incredibly conceited position to take like, Oh no, I know you better than you know you. Yeah. Like that's, that's a terrible thing to tell a kid because it and that applies to any situation right any kid that has some you know personality trait or identity anything that is maybe in at odds with the way their their the rest of their family is or or how they're brought up like any time they're told that that is not real or not appropriate or whatever you know incorrect thing they're told like it just sets up this scenario for them to be mired in self-doubt for the rest of their lives which is terrible yeah like I, I don't think people are thinking that through in terms of like developmentally you want to raise kids that are happy and confident and know that they know who they are and you know i mean that's what makes societies thrive that's what makes communities thrive not all of the weird fear and hiding and shame over something that isn't the least bit shameful i have such strong feelings about this to bring it back to star wars i mean that's what's been so great about sharing star wars with them is that like star wars has been more inclusive in that way and when you know we watched tales of the empire and there was a character using they them pronouns yeah. and like it didn't matter like that it was like a side character or watching rise i think part of watching rise of skywalker part of the reason that it's part of their favorite is that like even just that one shot of commander daisy kissing her wife mm -hmm. was like ooh queer people in the background like I see people represented it here. You know what I mean? Like yeah. just those little subtle clues that there was uh, acceptance there, that the rebels and the resistance were accepting of people made them feel more comfortable with it in a way that, that some of the other parts of star Wars hadn't before. Um, it, it's, I think Lucasfilm is doing a really great job with that march. I think they could go a lot further, but Sister is like literally like the most milk toast example of trans representation. Right. Um, <laughs> right? Like the only I mean yes, I'm really glad we got some trans representation on the Acolyte. I was really great that um the woman who does philosophy tube uh was in the Acolyte as one of the witches. Um, she was terrific in it and I would have loved to see her get a meteor part. Um, and I would love to see more trans actors, uh, and, and actresses, uh, just generally in, in star Wars. Um, but like sister was in two cameos in two books and has one image and has 
five lines and like like a five you know three sentences from captain rex in this source book it's not exactly like overwhelmingly down our throats right the way they might say you know what i mean like this is yes. not disney doesn't you know lucasfilm doesn't deserve a gold medal here this right. is this is very sort of a very low bar yeah so that was that was my rant i want to thank kate for putting sister in star wars um for all of those reasons and i want to thank mike chen for continuing that i want to thank everybody who's involved with this latest book for continuing it and i want to thank everybody who's going to like buy this book and support it and i want to thank everybody who's going to laugh at the people who are upset about this and i hope that everybody who is upset about it i hope that we can all have a productive conversation about why they shouldn't be upset about it because there's literally nothing to be upset about and if you have been bamboozled in this fabricated culture war into thinking that you should be upset about it um hopefully we can get you your head back on straight sooner than later yeah green a green so everybody, everybody be cool halsey what what yeah. what was halsey because i didn't hear about it until uh until i was in your cantina actually that was that was the first time <laughs> i got it yeah, um, so HalseyCon was a uh, super fan, super event for people who were big fans of the Galactic Star Cruiser and for the Galactic Star Cruiser community. Um, this is its first year. It just happened. It was small. It sold out very quickly uh, because they the organizers uh recognized you know it is a first year con so they didn't want to bite off more than they could chew i think it was only 600 attendees which is still substantial um especially uh the nature of that community where everybody kind of wants to hang out and stuff um it, it was really really wonderful and so uh we went um because we went i had to miss out on the rancho obi-wan gala which was the same weekend um but i did get to proxy bid which was pretty exciting and i won some stuff um but so halcycon was just a two day it was um the fifth and sixth the friday and saturday there was like a pre-game event thursday night which was like a a pre-party which was really wonderful um, it was like Halcyon Homecoming because everybody got to see each other again that haven't. And I will admit, I'm not um, – there are a lot of people in that community that are very connected, like, in Facebook groups and on Discord and whatnot. And I don't really participate in any of that. But I I knew a lot of people because I, you know, some of them were on my cruises with me and some of them are people I've connected with on social media and other places. And so it was a very – like, the vibe was – perfection it was just like super welcoming everybody just happy to see each other everybody just wants to party and hang out together um it was really really wonderful and so it was kind of interesting because going in um you know i had had a few people be like i don't i don't get it it's not official so what is it gonna be and even i even seeing some of the programming i really didn't like the enlisted in the guidelines or in the um the guidebook not the guidelines uh wasn't really sure like how is this all gonna fit together but it really was just like a giant two and a half day conversation of people sharing what they all loved about this same thing and the the programming was really wonderful in terms of like some of it was people you know talking about like um how to build a character for an immersive event like the Halcyon and you know obviously the the talking points were all very specific to Halcyon and the Star Wars universe but they weren't necessarily things that only applied there right like if you go and do another immersive event you can apply the same kind of ideas um I didn't go to that one I know there was one on food that I wanted to go to and I got tied up with something else so I couldn't um I went to a a really really wonderful uh, panel about uh, the unmade toys of the Halcyon uh, because there are a lot of people in the Halcyon community who 
are really creative and basically see the gap, you know, where it's that thing that I think many of us identify with of like, what I really want is this and it doesn't seem like it's going to get made. So I'm going to learn the skills I need to make my own. And so there's a lot of that in a lot of different ways, but in the toy panel, it was really, really wonderful. Several people, um, uh, Martin Smith, who was one of the con organizers, was there talking about, you know, his own collection and and whatnot. And then um, Bob from um, Cardboard Galaxy, who does these really, really nice, like, old school, if you're like my age and you grew up with like the first gen of action figures that often had like those little cardboard insets that you would you would play with and set up as your scenery. He does those and they're beautiful. Uh, and then um, Elias from Customs for the Kid who does custom action figures um, and I have one of his and it's amazing and then Max Fry who has been on our show before and who also does some some custom figures and they just all I mean in some cases they literally were doing like here's the step-by-step of how I did this custom action figure here's here are the things I use here are the materials I prefer here are the tools that I buy here are tools that are optional but it'll make it better and like every panel my understanding was kind of like that where it was just people sharing their information about what they have learned to do unique things to create things to themselves that fill that gap to you know keep all of it going um because we're in this weird space, right? Where this is a thing, the Halcyon and the Star Cruiser that doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. Um, it was kind of interesting. And the big takeaway, and I'll talk more about some of the other cool stuff that went on, but the big takeaway, which kind of harkens back to my rant, really was like, okay, we don't have the Star Cruiser anymore. But we have each other, so we get to decide what this means going forward and how we embrace, you know, the spirit of the Halcyon and kind of tell our own stories. Like, we're the ones that tell the story now. What we all have together as one uh, is really the important part. And so that to me was like such an uplifting idea and a really beautiful message to you know, okay, maybe that thing that you love the most is not part of what Lucasfilm or Disney are doing anymore, but that doesn't mean it's gone because it's still part of your experience and part of your story. And so um, that's, it's a very thrilling thing. All of the people in that community are so kind of tuned into that idea and tuned into continuing to build these relationships with one another and like the paths these that experience of being on the ship has led them down like some people it has really changed the the trajectory of their lives and they've been like oh i'm inspired to actually you know chase my dreams and do that thing that i didn't think i was ever going to get around to and other you know i was also in a, a little round table where people talked about how it had changed them and it was really lovely to hear how much you know, this one odd, wonderful experience really made people look at not, I mean, not even Star Wars, but at themselves in a different way. So it was a very, it was very wonderful. It was like, I kept referring to it as Star Wars up with people. I wish I could have been there. It sounds like a very cathartic experience. It was. And I hope they do it again. Um, there were so many fun aspects to it. One of the fun things that happened is the Kyberpunks, who have been guests on our show, played on Friday night. They were one of the live bands that played at the the party that night. And that was the most fun, right? Like, they literally had built a droid to, you know, perform with them that did all the droid parts. Um, and it was really good. There were some technical difficulties. Some of it was just, like, the the venue you know it was in a hotel ballroom and it just like the acoustics were not amazing in there but they were really wonderful they did such a great job people loved it the best was their final song they rick rolled us all they sang rick astley's never gonna give you up but entirely in hatties <laughs> it was so amazing people were screeching with delight and laughter it was just really fun and then there was um 
another band after that, which I missed because uh, one of my friends had come in late and I was helping her get her badge after hours and whatnot. So I didn't get to, to listen to all of that. But it was like fun stuff like that, right? Like the Kuiper Punks is something that, you know, I can't imagine that happening at most other cons, but it was like perfect there. And it was really, really fun. Um, there was also, I want to mention the, um, the Sabak room because there was a Sabak room where you could go and it was beautifully decorated. Like they really had set it up to look like a cool little gambling den. And it wasn't that little, it was kind of a big room, but it felt very intimate And, like, there were different little um, kind of tented off pavilions for different tables and whatnot. And they would teach you how to play Sabacc, but also they had a tournament on the second day, I think, um, which benefited Make-A-Wish, I believe. And that was just amazing. Like, what a cool, you know, completely fan-developed um project that was really really wonderful and added so much to the whole thing there's a vendor's room where people could sell all of the amazing stuff that they've been making um there was just so much delight it was really good and very kindly they um the con organizers worked with Hachette, who is the publisher of of our criminalia book and so there was criminalia um, killer cocktails advertising throughout which was so incredibly kind, even though it did not really match the theming. They were lovely. <laughs> what sort of sabak was it? Because now there's there's a whole bunch of different. All of the sabak. Yeah. So if you're on, you know, if you if you ever went on the Halcyon, you know, there is a specific version that gets played there, which is called Corazon Shift. It's a simpler, and to my mind, faster to learn sabak than Corelli and Spike, which includes like all of the poker hands and stuff. Um or I should say the poker style hands. And then, so they had Corazon Shift, of course. They had Corelli and Spike. And they also had the new version of Sabacc that you can play in Star Wars Outlaws. The Castle so, Sabacc. Yeah, so it I'm, was a cool mix of all of those. Can I tell you I'm in love with Castle Sabacc? Everyone is. Everyone I know is super into it. I only, like have played a little bit of outlaws, not as much as I wanted because I've, my schedule has been bananas. Um, so I only got to like dip my toe, but I really want to get into it. And I bought a Kessel Sabak deck while I was there. Um, it's on pre-order. I won't get it for a bit, but um, oh, where, where, where can you pre-order them? I didn't even know. Um, hyperspace props is making full sets. If you want all of the stuff or you can just get the deck or you can just get the, um, the um the chips that shift things the shift chips um <coughs> they have them uh, i think they're the only ones making that deck so far and it's beautiful they are on pre-order so it'll be a little while before people get them but worth it worth it um loads of excitement oh boy because mm. i think i'm just going to do that because <laughs> I I really really I really love it and Kingston has been playing it too and we've just been absolutely in love with it and it's such a simple version of it yeah um it's just a great game we'll talk about Outlaws more but yeah I have played so much Kessel Sabak <laughs> I have been debating for a while and I was just talking to one of my friends about it at length yesterday. Brian and I have both been talking about like, what if we got like a regular Sabacc game together, you know, where like once a month or whatever, everybody comes over to the cantina and we all play. Um, And I want to do that. I'm a little daunted by it because, you know, we all have to learn it. Like I would want to be able to play all versions of Sabacc, but uh, yeah, it might very well happen. We'll see what we'll see what happens in the not too distant future. Maybe over the holidays when we all have a little bit of time off, mm-hmm. we'll have a day where we get together and see what's realistic. Yeah. Because I just want to do immersion all the time. <laughs> all the time. Yeah, I know, I know. Um what else what else uh, stood out to you at, at Halsicon? I mean, it sounds like a great time, but you you were also there like right at the cusp of uh, a hurricane. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I was like, you know, on one hand, I was like, oh, man, I really wish I could go to Halsicon. And then as soon as it was coming up and I was looking at the weather and I was like, you know, I'm really glad I didn't go. <laughs> no, Halsicon timing was fine for it. Um, a couple days later, it was a little bit dicier. We, um, oh, this will lead to a second mini rant about entitledness. Um, we were already scheduled. Like our plan was we were there for Halsicon. We would check out of that hotel, which is not on Disney property on Sunday, move over to Disney, go to the Halloween party, spend all day Monday on Batu, And then Tuesday we would probably get brunch with friends and roll out. And we had been watching the weather pretty closely. Um, and during the weekend, it was apparent like nothing was going to happen. We weren't sure at first, projections were that it might make um landfall on tuesday uh and then that shifted as it had slowed down in the gulf and was just kind of sitting there for a while so we stuck to our original schedule although on monday we um we had been out you know running around with friends we had dinner with friends uh at the end of the day in the park at brown derby which was a spectacular dinner. Um, and as we were going back to our hotel from that, Brian and I were both like, okay, we're going to go to bed, get up really early. We're not going to meet anybody for breakfast and we're just going to get the heck out of Dodge. Um, because, you know, at that point there were some places in Florida that were already reporting that they were having gas shortages. And we were just like, I don't want to stick around, not be able to put gas in the car. Um, you know, not risk getting stuck because I had to come back to work. And also, you know, we wanted to see our cats. Um, so that's what we did. And we made it out just fine. That drive back was rough because everybody was trying to evacuate. Um, we did get gas, no problem. And because our car that we take on road trips is a hybrid, it got us very far on one tank of gas. So we were pretty far away before we needed it again. So we were okay. Um, but like, that's normally a six and a half hour drive for us. And it took 11 hours. Oh, wow. So it was a lot of, a lot of people trying to get out of Florida, um, which then also led to a number of, you know, accidents and whatnot. Um, yeah, it was just a rough, very trafficy. I have never had a trafficy drive quite like that from Florida, but, um, but we did, you know, we got home just fine. We kind of were expecting it. So it wasn't too harrowing, I guess, for lack of a better word. Um, yeah, I would have been flying and that's a whole different, that's a horse of a different color. A yeah. Of a on, different color. on Wednesday, MCO shut down. Um, so if you've been leaving on Tuesday, like we were, you would have been okay. But here's, oh, here's my mini rant. Another As one. I was, yeah, it's my mini rant. It's about humans. Um, so I got up, got dressed right away, started taking stuff out to the car. And on one of my passes through the lobby, there was a guest there at the concierge desk asking, well, what are you going to do to entertain us during the hurricane? And I wanted to spin around and go, like, keep you alive? Like, what? what? <laughs> like, they were really, they seemed kind of angry that Disney was, you know, going to be closing the parks during a hurricane. I don't, it was really weird to me. And I just, it made me so angry at humans. Um, you know, while that was all happening, like, we can literally see the housekeeping crew, the groundskeepers, the maintenance staff all of custodial, like running around the resort, trying to like batten down the hatches and get everything ready. And I kept thinking like, these people have homes of their own. They should be securing. And just to hear someone be like, yeah, but you're going to entertain me. Right. I was like, what? <laughs> That's so, uh, what? Oh man. Um, And thankfully Orlando did not get hit as hard like tampa took a really rough hit on that one orlando everybody i had you know was texting all the people i know that live there the next morning and they had uh, a rough night it was certainly loud and and stormy but it it really was not as bad there as it was closer to the coast so uh i presume those people were entertained at least by their television at that point um 
till the power went out. Oh, that was a cool Halcyon thing I didn't mention. In the hotel rooms at the conference center, the TVs had been programmed to look like the portal from your cabin. Oh, wow. And it ran all weekend long. So you kind of got the whole, like somebody had clearly recorded the entire um, experience worth of content from the portal. And that got used and put through closed circuit, which was really cool. Did somebody record it or did somebody get it slipped to them? Mm. Uh, Based on the quality of it, it looked like a recording. Mm. Okay. Because it seems like that's the sort of thing, you know, because like I've heard stories about how like all the R2 builders actually got all of the R2 sounds slipped to them by Ben Burt because he was just like, you know, uh, it'd be better if you just used these. (laughs) (laughs) I, I do not know. I do not know. But yeah, that was definitely a case where it was somebody's recording. I really hope we, there there were. Um, I really hope we get some indication soon about what's going on with the Halcyon. And I hope that it can I, open to do something sooner than later. I don't think we will, but that's just me. I'm not saying that we will. I'm saying I hope we will. Yeah, I don't think we will. I'm. I don't want to. I don't want to stomp on your hope, but. Well, you just did. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> I just. I want to go back. I do. I've too. got a lot of fond memories of that place, Holly. I got married there. I mean. I mean, I feel you. You know, yeah. I love that place. Um. But I. I don't think we're gonna get any. Any commentary from Disney anytime soon. It just it's it's so disappointing where it's it's just like it feels like the decision to close it felt so rushed. And I hope they regret it. I hope that Bob Iger loses sleep over that decision every night. I mean, I don't want to crush your dreams again. I don't I, mean, I don't think they do. I wish they would, but I don't think so. Is there a dream of mine you won't crush if I mention it, Holly? Um sure. I'm sure there is. <laughs> we'll just we'll just I'll 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 get a Rolodex of all of them and we'll see which one. But I will say this, right? You could, if you know, if Halcyon happens again, which I certainly hope it will, you can go to that and it's almost as good. In terms of having all the fun, which is, you know, it lives on in its own way. Yeah. I just want to be, I don't know. Like it, It's weird. I do feel like I can imagine there's this, I look back on it now, and even through my own videos, because I took a ton of video, I look back on it. And it's almost it's it's different than when I look back and scour the Internet for Adventurers Club like videos. Yeah, because I was there and I never got to go to the Adventurers Club. But I see like 10 years from now, people are going to be looking at the Halcyon the same way I was looking at the Adventurers Club. Oh, yeah, man, I wish I could have been there. And there's that really small club of people. And with the Halcyon, it's a much smaller club of people. Yeah. Who got to experience that? And uh, I feel very, very privileged to have been able to to experience it once uh, when I did. And, uh, you know, they can't take that from me. Truth. Truth. I just wait. I can't wait until a cast member comes up and tells me Bob Iger deleted that from my memory. (laughs) <laughs> i mean it's the uh it's the uh the same machine that george gave disney to ruin people's childhoods yeah it's time travel <laughs> uh yeah yeah i mean i here's my hope because i i I will say this. I don't have a lot of hope that the Halcyon is going to come back in any way as the Halcyon. 
But I do think that there's a high chance that the ideas of it, like in terms of the ideas of immersive storytelling and getting people involved in, you know, adventures and quests and stuff, I do think that that will manifest in some form. I don't know what it will be. Um, I just don't think it'll quite be the Halcyon. I think it'll be something else. That's just my conjecture. Well, if that's where we got to leave it. (sighs) I mean, I will take any Halcyon over zero Halcyon. Right? It lives in our hearts forever. I just want to go to the Sublight Lounge. Oh, me too. All day, every day. All Um, day, every day. So... Where can people find you, Holly? And congratulations, because this is coming out. You've got a new book, so congratulations. Thank you. Um, Yeah, that's just weird. Um, Yeah, you can find me in my imaginary sublight lounge or my cantina, which is not imaginary, thankfully. Um, And uh, I'm on Twitter as Surliest Girl and on Instagram as Girly 5 and my book that I wrote with Maria Tremarchi uh, as a, uh, an offshoot of the Criminalia podcast called Killer Cocktails is out now, uh, which is weird to say, <laughs> uh, which features uh, historical true crime and cocktails inspired by each of the stories, as well as every cocktail has a correlated mocktail. So if you're not a drinker, but you do like delicious beverages... You got it. Um, that's out now. You can buy that anywhere books are sold, which is weird and delightful to say. How about you? Uh, you can find me at swankmotron.com. And uh, you can find all of my associated stuff there and all of my social media is at swankmotron. Uh, so you can you can find me there. I've got another set of Star Wars cards coming out this month, uh, I'm told. So you can you can find me in the land of Star Wars trading cards, uh, which has been really fun. Uh, and uh, I should have another Battletech collection, a, a book, uh, a collection of a serial novel coming out next month. Uh, as I get more details about that, I'll be able to let everybody know. Nice. Um, and, uh, as far as full of Sith is concerned, you can go to full of Sith.com, listen to the entire back catalog of episodes, uh, at full of Sith.com. You can email us at holocron at full of Sith.com. Uh, you can find us on social media at full of Sith and you should rate and review the show wherever it is you listen to it and, you know, tell your friends about us or something. So unless you think there's anything else we missed, Holly. No. We could go on one more rant. No, just share your joy and let other people have theirs. How about that? Um, so, for Super Producer Mike Pilot, and for Holly Fry, I'm Brian Young, and the Force will be with you. Always. If you're not be needing me, I'll close down for a while. <coughs>